to get started. I want to say good morning to everyone that's joining us. My name is Aaron Jenkins. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at the Expectations Project. And I'm glad that you're able to join us today for an important panel and discussion on the topic of education issues facing the Black community uh, during COVID-19. And actually, given the weight of not only COVID-19, but many of the things that we are dealing with as a community, I'm going to take a uh, moderator privilege and just have a moment of silence. Thank you for allowing me that privilege. Um, it is not lost on me that as we've gathered together with a dynamic panel of professionals who work in various sectors that will help us to have this conversation, uh, COVID-19 is one of, of several things that we as a community and society are dealing with, but especially as a Black community. So just naming that. Thank you for that moment of silence. I want to thank uh, not only my colleagues at the Expectations Project, but especially my colleagues at the United Negro College Fund uh, who have been uh, stalwarts in helping not only to organize this panel and the panels that will follow, uh, but also a resource that we'll be sharing with you uh, and this concept, this discussion that we'll be having today. My colleagues include uh, Ascala Davis, Kalila Long, uh, William Brown, Sekou Biddle, uh, and we've been joined by uh, uh, students that also volunteer and work at the UNCF. So we're thankful for everyone who is a part of this. Uh, why are we gathered today? We believe uh, between our two organizations, we came together with the belief that faith is inextricably linked to justice. Justice is a just behavior or treatment of individuals, uh, and faith is a belief or belief system that people hold. And one of the things that UNCF and their research found was that there was a huge correlation between people of faith, the Black community, and their trust of those communities. And something that the Expectation Project really centers our work around is how people of faith, people of moral compass, no matter the faith background, how they can be more active in the advocacy that we believe is critically important today. Our public, our nation's public schools. We have 55 million young people in the K through 12 public school, uh, uh, excuse me, school system. About 50 million are in the public school system. And about 5 million fall into the private school and or homeschool section. Of course, with COVID, we know that those numbers may be shifting. But we thought if that's such a large number of our overall population, uh, the question that comes up in faith is how do we treat the least of these? So one of the things that we identified in our work together, uh, UNCF having 75 years of work in this space, over 75 years, uh, providing high quality education opportunities, the expectation project, looking at again, that relationship between communities of faith, whether individuals, groups, or people, uh, and the work that can be done, making sure that all God's children have a high quality education. Uh, so that's what brought our two organizations together. Uh, and you can see on your screen, uh, we, we realized that there is a call, uh, that if people have a profession of faith, uh, then that means that there is must follow action. Uh, so what is gonna happen to address the, 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 the vast numbers of uh, communities of places of worship, over 300,000 in America, and also correlating that with the number of high poverty schools, which data has shown to be at least 23,000 high poverty schools, which means the students qualify for free or reduced lunch. We know that there's a correlation between uh, the resources that a school has or lacks and the quality of education that's received. So we think that this is an important topic that must be addressed. So we identified the problem. There are several key points we wanted to highlight for you. One being that uh, regarding school districts that serve students of color, we found that there's at least an $1,800 difference in state and local funding per student than districts with fewer students of color. What does that correlate to? A number of other things that when you do the research, you start to find, such as 1.7 million students who have uh, a sworn law, law enforcement officer, but don't have a school counselor. Think about that for a second, that when a student walks through the school, and if you grew up in Washington, D.C., like me, at a public school, you walk through a metal detector and you see an officer, possibly before you see a school counselor, someone trained to help you. We also learned that uh, African-American graduates are four times less likely than white students to meet their college readiness benchmark. So when we identified some of these problems, we realized there was a call that needed to be made. There was something that needed to happen. Uh, and we thought, let's look at the correlation again between the faith community and the black community. And we found these numbers, 89% of black clergy uh, talk to their 
community, their parishioners about improving education. We found similar numbers uh, are providing information and engagement of their clergy, of their parishioners, whether they're parents, students, or educators, um, hosting events that make sure they connect. Uh, UNCF continues to do research and found that churches were identified as a key influencer and a trustworthy source for Black parents and supporting their child's education journey. You continue to go on and you see correlation between people's practicing of their faith and recognizing that more support should go to our public schools. That also includes the number of pastors and the number of practicing Christians that believe that Christians should be involved in the improving of our public schools. So that brings us to today, that brings us to our panel. We're really honored to have um, a distinguished group that will help us explore these themes further. So without ado, I'll go ahead and get started in introducing our panelists. Our first panelist I'll introduce is uh, the Reverend Dr. Kendrick Curry, who uh, has spent 17 years pastoring the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, in his role, he has not only been a faith leader, but a community leader and is board chair for an organization that works on education issues here in Washington, D.C., Education Forward, D.C. He is well-educated, having received his Bachelor of Science from Prairie View A&M University, his Master's of Science and a PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Michigan, his Master's of Divinity, uh, and a number of certificates uh, related to faith education from the Virginia Union University, uh, and also is listed uh, on his bio. But if I could focus on the most important piece, or one of the most important pieces, he is a proud father and an a outstanding husband uh, to his wife and to his children. We thank you for being with us, Pastor Curry. We're going to go on to our next panelist, uh, the Samantha Davis, who is the founder and executive director of the Black Swan Academy, an organization that is dedicated to creating a pipeline of Black youth civic leaders. And this is true to form. I've been a part of programs that Black Swan Academy has done. And what uh, Ms. Davis and her organization has done is that they center young Black youth, where they are the leaders and they are in the roles to do the work. She is an advocate, trainer, organizer, and unyielding optimist and believes that the community uh, can do the work needed to get the things done that must happen. She has a master's from American University in public policy, uh, and her work has been recognized nationally uh, throughout the country and here in Washington, DC, as well as by Essence, recognizing her in the 2019 Woke 100. Uh, Ms. Davis, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. We are now gonna introduce our next panelist, Dr. Lynn Jennings, who is a uh, staff member and is the Senior Director of National and State Partnerships at the Education Trust. Uh, she leads the organization's initiatives to engage and mobilize a diverse group of advocates at the national, state, and local levels, working to change the and close the opportunity and achievement gaps that exist. Uh, prior to being at EdTrust, she was a Senior Legislative Associate there as well uh, while she was there and has worked on legislative campaigns around the organization related to K through 12 and higher education work. Uh, she has a rich history being an educator in various uh, subject areas, including English, African-American studies and women's studies. She received her Bachelor of Arts in English from V. Spelman College. Let's go Atlanta, stand up. And her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in English. Uh, Dr. Jennings, we are honored to have you. Uh, our last panelist is Mr. Fred Jones. He is the Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at the Southern Education Foundation, where his responsibilities include advocating for the advancement of SES public policy and priorities at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, he has created and led a team of policy positions and statements that focus on extending SES uh, prop, uh, population and their impact throughout the South. He has his Bachelor of Arts from Tufts University, and he receives his Master's in Business Administration from the Raleigh Institute of Diverse, excuse me, from the Robert H. Smith School of Business. I want to get it correct. I'm jumping around in your bio. We thank you, Mr. Jones, for being with us uh, and look forward to a robust conversation. With that, we're going to bring up our panelists, and we're going to start this conversation. Uh, I just want to give a few housekeeping tips, and I apologize that I jumped ahead of myself before having a chance to do so. For our uh, audience, I'm gonna ask questions for probably the next um, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but prior to that, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A feature, uh, and that is where you can ask questions. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna give a cue to our tech 
as we are going to ask you a question. We're gonna have a polling question that's gonna pop up on your screen uh, and then we're gonna jump into the Q&A. So apologies to the panelists, I'm getting my, my cues back for, for what needs to happen. So the question we wanna ask you is, how did you hear about this event? Um, how did you learn about this event for our attendees that are attending? How did you learn about this event? Go ahead and pick one of these items, whether it was through email, through Facebook, Twitter, or Eventbrite. We're gonna give you a moment to do that. Uh, and then after that poll is concluded, we're gonna jump back to the panelists and begin our question. So again, poll that's up right now, how did you learn about this event? Was it an email? Was it through a social media medium such as Facebook or Twitter? Or was it through Eventbrite? Thank you in advance for answering that question for us. And now that you've answered that question, we thank you to our uh, attendees. And now we get to go to our illustrious panel. Uh, and panel, we're gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna ask a question. I'm gonna ask if everyone can um, respond to this question. If it's all right, maybe we'll go in the order of our introduction. So we'll start with you, Pastor Curry, uh, and then we'll go to you, Ms. Davis, and then we'll go to you, Dr. Jennings, and then uh, Mr. Jones, you can close us out. Uh, and that question is, what are some of the challenges that you see in your work? Uh, whether it's in community or in your uh, your daily work that's been uh, impacted uh, and caused by COVID-19 and the connection, again, between the Black community and education. So, Pastor Curry, take us away. What, what, have, you, what have you seen? Well, first of all, Aaron, let me just thank you for the privilege of being able to be on this esteemed panel today. And certainly, we are grateful for the Expectations Project as well as UNCF. This, this is going to be an exciting time. Um, one of the things that um, you could have asked that I think is so very critical and important is, you know, what is the real impact on the Black um, um, community and children in, in the area from, and what are we experiencing? So as, as I was jotting it down, my list almost became endless. We started with, you know, we can talk about learning loss or educational debt. But as I see it from the ground where I, where I work and where I, I pastor and actually live, um, I'm noticing hunger um, and great, great poverty, specifically hunger from the standpoint of just looking at, uh, we are feeding over 800 families a week up from 100. I see frustration and anger where we're dealing with people who are acting out and that leads to a whole host of things. One, we're seeing increase in drug use in and around from opioid addiction to other things. We're also looking at mental health crises and challenges with regard to uh, all sorts of things. Even we are partnering with mental health groups right here at the church and uh, our numbers are exploding. We're also looking at what this thing means to even deal with public safety. We have an increase in gun violence that is happening in and around the community as well as other sorts of uh, violence that we're contending to deal with. So we're looking at a plethora of problems that are seemingly endless and we're, we're just beginning to really cut the surface. I will also say as in specific um, regards to COVID, we're seeing unusual numbers with regard to having problems with education in terms of the digital divide. I get calls every day with regard to people that not only they may have a computer, but they don't have the internet. They may have mm -hmm. internet capabilities, but they don't have the computer. Or they may have both, but then they don't have the place to begin to operate or use a computer because there are more people in a two bedroom than, than they could ever begin to imagine. So the problems seem to be endless. They're daunting, they're overwhelming. And mm -hmm. I just wanna, um, close out these initial comments by saying one of the things that is I'm seeing more than anything else is a lack of trust, a lack of trust of a number of, of political officials, um, a lack of trust of those that are in the medical communities and folks uh, in my that I've spoken with feel like they've been let down to some degree. They've been let down by having misinformation in the media. They've been let down by finding themselves really thinking that they'll be safe, but now they're finding that they're, they're not safe. And, and if you don't have um, 
um, adequate resources, then you seem to really, really be left behind. So I, I, I am so excited about this panel and I, and I could go on, but I, I think we need to really begin to talk about what is this particular issues that are plaguing our community and sure. impacting us by COVID-19. Thank you very much for that, Pastor. You touched on a number of points, and I, I'm appreciative that you touched on the points that are both within the school, but also within the community that we know impacts school. Uh, thank you for that, and I think it's a great transition to Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis, I know with your work with Black Swan Academy, you work very closely in the, in, the, in the community. So the same question, if you can share some of the challenges that you've seen in your work or in community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, I would echo every single thing Pastor Curry said um, to to just step back a bit about how it has impacted the work for us. Um, I would say since March 13th or whenever that was um, that the schools closed, um, we immediately heard from our families and our young people um, about this fear of uh, scarcity and recognizing that um, our systems have already failed our families in so many ways. Um, it wasn't ne necessarily a lack of trust, but a pretty, um, a, a pretty just well-known understanding that their needs were not going to get met. Um, and so we immediately jumped into action by um, providing families um, and young people all throughout the city um, through DC Mutual Aid Network, as well as through um, our internal efforts at Black Swan Academy to be able to try to supplement um, the food, try to supplement hygiene products, cleaning products, um, PPE, things of that nature. Digital, the digital divide, especially in the beginning was huge. Young people were expected to be able to finish out the school year without laptops, without equipment, without um, internet. Um, and so while we have seen that improve slightly this, this current school year, um, that was the most alarming, um, I think an immediate um, impact that this had. We've had to move all of our programs virtually immediately. Um, and as you can imagine, having young people who are in school all day via laptop, um, then being able to engage them extracurricular activities, especially with middle school students, it is quite difficult um, to do that. And so a question around youth engagement and youth development is still um, a lingering question. How do we effectively do that? Um, and then lastly, I'll just add, um, especially for the Black community, Black Swan Academy is 100% Black staff. The majority of our young people are Black students um, or and all of them are students of color. Um, and so we've been impacted greatly by the trauma that COVID-19 has brought on to our communities, the trauma that this uprising and the racial injustice that we've been experiencing both nationally and here locally with the death of uh, Dion K, what that has done um, and caused in our, in our lives. We have had I would say 90% of our staff has lost a person um, who was mm. close to their immediate family. Um, wow. Our young people have lost individuals. One of our young people um, lost five people due to COVID-19 um, and his close family, right? And so the question of how do we, in, in an already under-resourced school setting and mm -hmm. already under-resourced communities, especially when it comes to caring for the mental health um, of our community members, how do we now deal with the the more um, the more present um, and consistently present trauma due by um, due by COVID nineteen as well as the racial injustice. Great, thank you very much, uh, Samantha. You summarized very uh, well just a number of pieces. I picked up scarcity, system failure, under resourced communities. I mean, you touched on a lot of topics that I think we're going to make sure we continue to pick up on. So, thank you for flagging that. Uh, Dr. Jennings, we'd love to ask you the same question, just challenges that you've seen in your work uh, related to COVID-19, education, and the Black community. Well, th first of all, thank you, Erin, for having me. Thank you for the Expectations Project and UNCF. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel. Uh, I think, I mean, a lot I'm just going to echo, right, um, and say that um, the, what we're seeing, the scarcities, the disparities we've seen, they've been there. Um, the under-resourced schools, they've been there. These are things that advocates like us have been talking about for years and years. And what it did, I think what COVID did was put a light on it um, in a way that you had to deal with it right there in your face. Um, so that was, um, and, it, and it happened abruptly and so suddenly. So 
I mean, we, we, I would say back in March when it got started and like, that's what happened immediately was we have this hemorrhaging, how are we going to stop it? What's going to happen with students as, you know, within a week, they're told they can't go back to schools. Um, teachers and educators have to transfer what they've been able to do in the classroom into a virtual setting on platforms they're not familiar with. Um, and then also the, all the other things that schools and school communities provide from, um, from dealing with hunger and food um, to even having support systems. Like what we're seeing more and more are the families that are now feeling some more of the economic loss in terms of job loss, you know, which we may not have seen quite as much in the spring, um, but now we're hearing more and more about that and what's happening with, with families in that way. Um, obviously a lot around the digital divide, which, which, we, which we've also covered. So, um, so that's where we were definitely in the spring is how to immediately um, try to get folks the resources that they need. Um, I would say now we're moving into, and, and let me put it, and I, and I will say, I think also what happened at the time when that, when there was so much attention to everything, um, it became real for students and families that may not be exper ex experiencing this, think that's somebody else's problem, it became their problem, you know, really quickly, whether it's because um, they, it was their child's um, classmate next to them, or was a school down the street, or you just heard about it everywhere, it was in the news. Um, now what I think we're dealing with is that we're kind of going back to status quo and where, and right. where we are, particularly with us working more on the more on federal and state level um, policy and thinking about how we address some of these policy issues, address some of these issues through policy, um, is that um, there's a real, we have a real concern that um, there's, yeah, there's this, this is stagnant going on mm -hmm. right now where um, folks are saying we tried to help before now we're not quite sure what we wanted what we should do what we can do and then of course we have a whole nother campus like it's over let's keep moving <laughs> um, yep. so um, and we can I can talk more about that but that's one of I would say you asked about challenges that's one of the challenges mm -hmm. we have the other okay. challenge just as an advocacy organization is how to do the advocacy I mean, even for mm -hmm. us that was a learning curve on how you put together advocacy campaigns and um, bring together people to talk about some of these issues and think about how you're going to mobilize people. Um, and so we've, um, we've, we've done everything from our um, state director in Tennessee has started doing watch parties, putting together virtual advocacy, advocacy training sessions. Um, we just did a huge convening with about 200 advocates across the country, wow. just doing those kind of things of thinking about how do we make sure that we're in communication with each other and using the tools we have and sharing the tools we have to make sure we're getting the word out and getting the change that we want to see. That's great. I really appreciate you picking up on that idea of how advocacy organizations have had to adjust their tactics to address the problems that exist. So not being undone by it, but also making sure that we can address the pieces such as the resources. You also made a great point about time. I didn't think about that. When COVID started versus now us becoming accustomed to it, and part of that transitioning back to status quo, communities that are without not only continue to be without, but may be even more negatively impacted. Thank you for your points, Dr. Jennings. We'll close with you, uh, Mr. Jones, if you can add uh, your reflections to the group as well. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank you to the Expectations Project and UNCF. I'm honored to be on a panel uh, with my esteemed colleagues and, and panelists here. Um, again, I'm Fred Jones, the Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at the Southern Education Foundation. We are a, a regional advocacy, research, and leadership development organization. And so um, for us, what we've been doing, or what I especially have been doing, is following the data, specifically as it relates to uh, the advancement or uh, the retraction of uh, opportunities for students of color and African-American students specifically. And so what the data has shown has been quite clear even prior to COVID. Uh, according uh, to uh, the census, 30% of African American students do not have access, adequate access to the internet. Black children are uh, three times as likely not to have internet at home as compared to their white peers. And additionally, um, the Southern Education Foundation is focused obviously on the Southern region and improving outcomes in the Southern region. And based on the latest data, 55% of Black children are actually educated in the South, but nine out of the 10 least connected states, least connected in terms of providing internet and having broadband available, 
are in the South, with Mississippi leading the way, with almost 30% of African-American children in Mississippi, Black children, that is, don't have access to internet. What that wow. does is it provides, um, or actually it, it does not allow uh, many students to participate in a way that's equitable, um, in a way that um, basically in this public health crisis that we're in, there are many students who are just not able to participate. And we saw that honestly back in March, nothing Lynn brought up today, we have fallen into the status quo where still some students either um, are not gonna be able to access the information that they need to improve uh, and learn, or they're gonna jeopardize their public health. And so we're in this um, we're in this really bad situation, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. But just because of this digital divide, um, Black students and African American students, particularly, are at a disadvantage. So that's what we have seen specifically. Um, I would say, secondly, which actually has been already mentioned by uh, some of my panelists already, is the non-academic needs: um, mm -hmm. nutrition, um, hunger, mental health services especially uh, in the black community as adults and children alike are getting sick and or passing away, unfortunately, from COVID, um, the trauma that's associated with it, um, that black students in particular need mental health services and they're not able to access it now because of the times that we're in. And even if they were um, in a safe way, they're not able to even do that from um, uh, digitally, from an online perspective to get that support. Mm -hmm. And I would say lastly, um, which also has been touched on a little bit, is the potential of learning gaps. Um, there already was an opportunity, uh, an achievement gap between black students and, 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 and white students. It's only being exacerbated now because there are many times that students were able to transition um, from uh, working um, in the physical space of a classroom uh, and transitioning digitally, um, usually wealthier communities wealthier and most of the time wider communities, but there are other communities who still just have not been able to receive high quality instruction since March of last year. And so um, we're just in this, uh, this, unfortunately this is a really bad situation where there are just some students who are able to access information and, and continue their education and others just, um, they're not. And that learning gap is only being exacerbated at this moment in time. And oftentimes yeah. that is, is happening to be low income students and, um, Black students specifically. Great, thank you for your comments. You touched on a, a couple of important items in your your comments as well, which resonate with me with what others said. Identifying, you know, very specific issues, both academic and non-academic issues, and also topics that that are statewide. And we know that there is a correlation not only between um, local and state education, but also the role the federal government plays. So this next question is going to be geared uh, both towards Dr. Jennings and you, Fred. Uh, we know that Congress has passed several stimulus uh, bills, some of which have allocated funding for education, but states have also highlighted to your point about the responsibility of both the non-academic and academic needs that they expect very large shortfalls, budgetary shortfalls from COVID, uh, re especially related to how we fund education. So when you mentioned the gaps, not only the learning gaps and opportunity gaps, there's also a huge financial gap that public schools experience. I hope that you and, and Lynn, if the two of you could speak to us uh, a bit about what's at stake for public schools um, when related to those shortfalls and the role that government has. And from whatever perspective you'd like to take that, whether it's the federal government or whether it's state and local, we'd love to have you speak to that a little bit. So um, Lynn, yeah, you can go ahead and start it off your hands. Thank you. <laughs> Brad was uh, ready. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll just start it off and let you finish it out strong. Um, I'll just say what, I mean, we've been focused a lot on how we're going to have another stimulus. That was our hope we would have another stimulus um, bill from, from Congress um, by now. Uh, and our, what we're looking at is historically, if you go back to what, about 10 years ago with the Great Recession, how much um, low income um, communities and um, high poverty communities and people of color um, how in Black people, we're really talking about a lot of Black communities, how much they disproportionately shouldered that burden when we had that recession um, for all the kinds of reasons we talked about. But just to give an idea, um, I, I pulled up the number right before we, um, right before this panel, that during the Great Recession, states slashed nearly $24 billion in one year 
And that was just from education budgets. So you mm -hmm. know who that was slashed from. Um, and so one of our big pushes has been around um, when, because I'm gonna be optimistic that we are gonna get eventually um, another, another stimulus um, bill, another stimulus law. When we get it, students of color and students from low income backgrounds are not the ones who are shouldering um, the, any kind of budget cuts that we do see and do anticipate. Um, and so, but to do that, one of the lessons learned is that you have to put things within the law to um, make sure that folks know you're watching, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that really means like we want to see Congress really take some action and say, you must protect the financially vulnerable school districts and, and yep. students and schools. You must do that. That's that's what we call like our maintenance of equity. You've got to maintain some maintain some kind of equity, not equality, but equity. Um, and then also one of the big things that happened last time is the, the, um, the loss of thousands of teaching jobs and how mm -hmm. many um, schools lost teachers during that time, particularly because often um, in our most under-resourced schools and underfunded schools, that's where you have um, newer teachers. Um, and so they're the first to go, they're the first to be let go. And so, so many, so many students that was contributed to the learning loss, learning gap we want to talk about, so they just don't have um, the teachers there in the classrooms. So that's sure. another thing that we want to make sure we have this time that we didn't have last time is the data to show that, that if you do any kind of layoffs, we want to see the data disaggregated, where are these teachers being taken away from, which schools, what communities, what students are losing their teachers. Thank you for pointing that out. You touched on a really important point. I love the concept of having advocacy ideas or thoughts that need to be requested and making it very clear, um, not equality, but equity, the need of the protection for those that are financially needed, which you know has a heavy correlation with communities of color and that idea of loss of jobs. And for the teachers that haven't lost jobs, we know that they've been, just because they're part of the community, they also have been negatively impacted if they are parents as well, if they are trying to both educate others for their job, but also maintain their homes. So thank you for pointing that out. Fred, have you pick up on that if you want to touch on, again, role of government, whether federal, state, or local, uh, and what, what we should be paying attention to with that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Lynn uh, and a lot of what she said, but I, I would say the CARES Act that passed um, in late March provided roughly $30 billion um, in education money. And uh, I was trying to pull up the number um, to see like what that really means in real time for students. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find the number, so don't quote me exactly, but it is less, um, I think it comes out to about uh, around $500 per K through 12 student mm -hmm. who received money at that point in time. And so though $30 billion is a lot of money, and some of that was certainly segmented to the K through 12 uh, population, what that really means is it was roughly $500 per student across the United States. And so that is, you know, equality, not necessarily equity. And it also just didn't make as big a dent as we needed to at that point in time as well to really change the trajectory and the needs and meet the needs of school districts and students throughout the country. So one thing that I wanted to say is though that there was a, a huge federal, or, or there was a federal investment, much more resources are needed to change the impact uh, and change the trajectory of a child's education. And so that needs to be much more close to two and three, um, $3,000 per student. Um, mm -hmm. And again, we are focused on the South and in Southern states, uh, specifically in the South, there's about a $2,000 per student gap between the national average per pupil expenditures versus what is allocated in Southern states. And so um, when we're talking about what a federal uh, investment in students, there needs to at least be $2,000 per student more um, mm -hmm. so that we can bring up the regional uh, average to the national average. And in, in, in so one, we can re recruit more teachers, we can provide more resources to students specifically, um, provide more personalized instruction. Um, so that's like the federal role. I, I think one thing that I wanna get at is more money is necessary, uh, especially mm -hmm. in, in whatever next package is put together. I think the second thing that we wanna look at is states and, and what states are doing specifically. We know that the states are hammered by COVID-19 and the expected revenues that are coming in uh, is gonna be much smaller um, if, much smaller um, if it hasn't been impacted already and states haven't mm -hmm. uh, passed their budgets already. But one thing to know is typically, especially in the Southern states, 
education makes up the largest portion of state budgets. Essentially, education is 20% of a budget in Southern states. And so when uh, revenues are scaled back and when there's overall uh, across the board cuts, actually the education sector um, is adversely affected. It's disproportionately impacted because of how much money is already allocated to the education uh, system. And so one thing that we want to do is just make sure that if there are going to be cuts to state budgets, just don't cut education. Find other sure. ways to, to, to siphon around it. I think the other thing is certainly do not do, at, at a very minimum, do not cut education more than any other sector. And so we have to at least have some type of minimum threshold uh, for states to provide the basics uh, to our students. Um, and I think that's it. I, I'll leave it at that. But I think overall, my, my main message is both from a federal, at a federal level and at a state level, more money is necessary, but we have to target it in a way that it's impactful. We don't want to put more money into a broken system. We want to put more money into uh, students and, and um, activities that we know lead to academic achievement and student success. We have to target those resources yeah. in a way that's impactful, not just putting money into a broken system. I like that last point, targeted resources, uh, and especially towards success. That's going to bring me back uh, to you, Ms. Davis and Pastor Curry. You know, you are both in community, uh, and it's not lost to me that uh, uh, Dr. Jennings and Mr. Jones did an excellent job of identifying congressional responsibility and then kind of a broad picture of what's needed from the federal government to address that. We also know that uh, what if happens in the classroom is really indicative of what's happened in the community. Um, we know uh, that from where you both sit, the Black community faces a number of challenges that are non-academic challenges, but that have an impact academically. I wonder, you've identified challenges, but I wonder if you can identify or share things that you may have seen, ways that communities have come together, meaning ways that communities have bonded, banded together to address some of those challenges or work that you may have been actively a part of uh, that really get um, um, to the point of what you've seen that has worked and possibly if you've seen things that have worked, what could be replicated? So Ms. Davis, happy to start with you and then Pastor Curry, have you close? Sure. Um, I will say during this time, as disheartening as it is, um, it has also been filled with a lot of hope um, and inspiration by seeing just how much um, the Black community in particular has come together. Um, mm -hmm. As I mentioned earlier, we are a part of the DC Mutual Aid Network, a network of volunteers, a network of community members who absolutely believe in the power of mutual aid. Um, this idea that we keep us safe, um, that while systems um, in particular, racism and um, capitalism forces us to believe in scarcity, like forces us to, to think that resources are scarce, that when we look within our actual communities, we um, are, actually living a very um, abundant life or have the potential of living in abundance when we pull um, our resources together, um, when we take uh, small steps to build relationships, um, to collect um, the resources among us and put those together in order to support one another. And so um, what I have seen work best, I, I would say, is the model of, of mutual aid. Um, and, and in particular, this model of pod mapping, um, laying out who is in, on your block, um, who is within your apartment complex, um, mm -hmm. and building those relationships with them, right? I feel like most of us probably like grew up knowing that you can get sugar or whatever it is that you need right. from your next door neighbor. Um, and mm -hmm. so that is the practice that we have been um, relying on forever, but in particular, I think coming to light since COVID-19, um, the DC Mutual Aid Network east of the river alone um, has served over 5,000 um, family members um, and community members, um, and it's in its community serving community um, and supporting community, and it kind of just goes full circle. Um, and so I think that has been the most be beautiful thing that I have seen come out of this. And mm -hmm. within that, it's not just about those tangible, essential resources that you think about, the groceries, the hygiene products, but it's also about recognizing and building uh, healing spaces for one another. How are we supporting 
supporting each other during this time, addressing that trauma, holding and loving each other um, throughout this time. And so it's just been beautiful to be a part of um, and lets me know, I started this by saying I'm like hopeful and inspired and lets me know that if we push against this notion that we need to go back to normal, that we need to go back to the status quo, that what actually is meant to come out of this is a much beautiful, much more just safer, healthier world. Um, mm -hmm. And I have seen that in, in, a, in a very micro level. Um, and so interested in always being in a conversation about what does it mean and what does it look like to make that possible and to scale that up um, so that we all can benefit um, and thrive. I love what you said, the idea that even when when pressed down into the ground, this, I, there's this quote, uh, you, you buried us, but you didn't know we were seeds, that concept that uh, even in difficult times, community has the opportunity and ability to galvanize, to expand what it does well, and with additional resources to take care of itself. Absolutely. That's really important. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up mutual aid networks. Just wanna flag that. And Dr. Curry, bring it to you. I think it's important that we have you on as a pastor, uh, because I know in your space, you regularly work in these spaces. If you can also pick up where Ms. Davis left off and just share what your thinking is on things you've seen work in the community and how uh, folks have been addressing COVID within the Black community. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that I've seen most is, is really what Ms. Davis has just articulated. I've seen great measures of hope. I've seen people come together um, that would not necessarily ordinarily come together and really embody the principle of Ubuntu, I am because we are. And that whole understanding has been something that has been rich for us. Um, the most credible example that I can give is just the partnerships that have been formed to make sure that we can touch and, and have contact with people each and every week. And we have partnered with multiple partners like the DC Dream Center, among others, who have come together in unusual ways to serve a community. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to serve uh, families who have come to find themselves in great need. They're not only hungry, but they've also had unemployment issues. So what we've been able to do is have people come together, they're, they're not only fed, we feed over 800 families in a, in a given week, but we've also have opportunities to be a clearinghouse and a, and a place where you can begin to have discussions about what can we do with regard to jobs and job training. And another thing we've also done is in our partnership collection, we found that it's best to sort of bundle services. So you talk about jobs, you talk about uh, food, you talk and, and give away food, but you also are doing COVID testing. We were among one of the first churches to partner with Howard University Hospital, for example, to bring testing into the community um, and, and do it. And we wanted to do that at the church while we're doing food distribution. And so it's that notion of partnerships that we'll be able to sort of pull things together. Another thing that has really shown itself to be worthwhile is um, I've been leading and participating in a number of webinars in and around um, what we need to do around COVID-19. We've talked about where the pain points are, systemic racism and COVID-19, education and COVID-19. A group has been formed called the Black Coalition Against COVID-19, where we have doctors and other leaders, including faith leaders and, and other leaders from the city that have gotten around, gotten together to really be talk about what does this thing mean to our health and to our ongoing struggle to, to survive as a, as a people. But we realize that Black people are resilient people. We are people that will rise up and meet the challenges that are necessary. So we just need to put the systems in place. And that's what we've been trying to do um, mm -hmm. and with Black Coalition Against COVID, as well as the other webinars. Um, for uh, the older populations who we're finding that literally I have grandmothers that are taking care of grandchildren who mm -hmm. are dealing with matters of their own, their own health. So for them to be able to have opportunity to have internet and then find themselves learning about kidney disease and, and, and how to maintain their health so that they can take care of their grandchildren, those are the types of things that are, are really needed. And, and I say that as we continue to press on and move forward with regard to those needs that uh, precede the classroom, 
we, we are, are, are definitely looking at how we can better support our young people by opening the doors of the churches so that we can find ourselves coming together realizing that the kids need a place to be the mm -hmm. uh, adults have to go to work and we, we're creating supportive networks so that kids can continue learning beyond um, what they have in school because we feel that it's necessary to make sure that there are support that wraps them uh, wraps around them so that they'll be able to move forward and do what's necessary so those are some of the things that we've learned from just being on the ground I sure. think there are, there are many other things um, that that we can begin to talk about um, and I look forward to a few, a few more questions from in that area. Sure. Thank you for raising that. And thank you. Your comments and Ms. Davis's comments really resonated with me, this idea of the importance of community, the importance of uh, having supportive networks and finding those networks at multiple levels, uh, both within education and outside of education. It coupled well with what uh, Mr. Jones and Dr. Jennings shared as well about the responsibility that, that government had. So we have to know the data to be able to pinpoint where those resources go, but then we also need to make sure those resources are available on multiple levels. We have uh, had a few questions come in from the Q&A. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from UNCF, Ascala Davis, who's going to have a chance to share uh, what the audience has flagged as we've been having this robust conversation. So thank you to the panelists. I'm going to turn it over to Ascala to, to get to audience Q&A. Thank you, Aaron. Um, first, I want to thank the panelists um, for having such um, robust conversation addressing um, the disparities, the um, scarcities, the lack of resources to include um, the digital divide and mental health services um, within our communities, um, potential learning gaps, the achievement gap being exacerbated. Um, and asking, um, Samantha brought up a really good point, asking questions such as, how are we addressing the trauma um, that not only, uh, that our students are experiencing during this time? But I think those are very um, important questions um, because, you know, mental, as we know, mental health is a huge component. Um, in ensuring the well-being um, of our students. Um, so with that, I will transition into our Q&A. Um, we've had a few questions. I just wanna remind you all that you could drop um, additional questions if you'd like into um, the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, first, we have Zakia Jackson who asks, um, what resources in addition to money do your organizations need to sustain during the pandemic in order to continue advocating for our children? And I will um, direct that first to Samantha. Samantha Davis with Black Swan. Sure, thank you. Um, volunteers, I, I mentioned in this in this moment, right? Get, making sure com community has what we need is absolutely important. And the only way we do that is if the more more and more of us um, chip in. So. Um, for the mutual aid network in particular, what that looks like is drivers. We need people to do deliveries. We need people um, to pack. We need people um, to be in community and be in conversation um, with community members. And so um, if people are interested in volunteering, you all can reach out to me. I'll make sure you get my information to do that. I'm also looking for in-kind donations during this time. Um, kind of thinking of your essentials uh, your your food items, your hygiene products, your cleaning supplies, um, your diapers, things of, for, for our babies um, are in great need. But then also thinking about young folk. Um, and so those school supplies and things that young people can have just to have fun um, are also helpful. But in-kind donations, volunteers um, is what is needed during this time. And advocacy, to the extent we're doing a lot of advocacy efforts, so lending your voice to enhance and support the voices of Black youth um, is another way you can do that, whether we're talking about the digital divide, whether we're talking about removing police from schools, whether we're talking about increasing mental health supports, the more people we have speaking out um, uh, about those issues, the, the better and the more likely we'll get some wins um, in the near future. Thank you for that, Samantha. Um, Fred, if you wanna answer the same question, um, if you want, I could repeat the question. No, I got it. Thank you, Scholar. Um, I think in addition to uh, money and or financial resources, there's a, there's a few things that, that could be helpful to us. One, um, we need to continue to collect advocates throughout the South. If you are in a Southern state um, and you're interested in local and or state advocacy, especially as it relates to the digital 
digital divide, providing non-academic resources to students. Um, you know, if, if there's a way that we can be in partnership with you, um, we would love to be able to do that, especially uh, with community leaders and grassroots leaders. I think the second thing that we want to do is we are a research organization, and that means both quantitative and qualitative. We've done a, I think, done a, we've done a pretty good job on the quantitative side, but still we are learning from communities and individuals about best practices on how we can continue to serve our students. And so, for example, in Charleston County, uh, South Carolina, and others in um, school districts in the South, they are providing mobile Wi-Fi buses in into rural communities. They're bringing mobile Wi-Fi buses to actually faith-based communities and having students go there to do their homework and or uh, sign up on online. We want to continue to collect stories about how uh, communities are, are coming together and serving their students and that resolve so that we can share uh, those best practices with others. And so for us, we want to just continue to be in partnership, learn from others, share their stories, and collect advocates if, if, if folks are interested. And again, my information, uh, if you guys don't have it, but it's just fjones that's at southerneducation.org. Uh, um, and if anyone's interested in, in providing that information or becoming in partnership with us, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you for that, Fred. Um, it seems like the ask is for more advocates, for volunteers um, to help push the advocacy work. Um, so we will be sharing um, everyone's contact information. So please, um, if, you if you feel inclined, um, reach out to any of our panelists um, th through their organization um, webpage um, or their direct email addresses. And they'd be more than happy to point you in the right direct direction and partner with you. Um, our next question is from Sean um, Hardnett. Um, amazing conversation, thank you for that. Um, please describe ways that the faith community is meaningfully, meaningfully, excuse me, partnering with schools to support families in the pandemic. Exemplars that you would like to lift. And I'll start um, with you, Pastor Curry. One of the things that um, we've done, and thank you for the question, is, and I, I mentioned it before, but I, I, I will drill deeper, um, is just being part of, of, of a network that allows folk to have uh, food that is necessary. We, our church sits across the street from Randall Highlands Elementary School and a number of those parents and those families um, uh, come from that particular school to connect with us and make sure that they have some of the things that they needed for their daily sustenance. I, I'd like to lift that example. There are other faith communities that are have also partnered with schools, adopted with schools, and not only provide the necessary um, uh, toiletries and other sorts of things that are needed and personal protective uh, uh, gear. But I, I want you to understand that what they've been able to do is to come in and just be a ministry of what we call presence. Be present in the schools, be those that are able to talk to people. We've created a, a virtual health ministry, for example, and that's a way of us connecting with people, not only in the local church, but also the school's and the community around. And as such, we are finding out what are the deeper needs. And that's a way that we've sort of partnered at our church, Pennsylvania Avenue, to go even further into the community so that we know what are the social determinants of health, which determines about 80% of what folk are experiencing day to day. And so those are the more meaningful ways to go deeper into the community, to know even the deeper needs, whether we're dealing with all sorts of housing issues or whether we're dealing with public safety matters or what the real root causes are. And so we're finding houses of worship and of faith that are drilling down into those sorts of areas um, where they're dealing with parents and they're dealing with multiple dimensions of, of need that, that are in, in the households and the families that are around. Thank you for that, Pastor Curry. Um, and our final question, um, before we transition to our closing, um, I'll direct to uh, Lynn. And this is a question from Stephanie, who is a Spelman, uh, currently a senior at Spelman College. Um, for students who are in higher education but are severely impacted by COVID-19, how can your organizations provide solace for those students? 
first I have to say hello to my Spelman sisters. Um, hi, Stephanie. Um, so I think like, again, we, we often our organization divides it into the two, like two categories. One is the immediate, you know, making sure that institutions of higher ed um, are safe spaces for students. Um, just the public health safety and, and concerns about that and making sure that um, colleges, universities have what they need if they're gonna bring students back to campus that they can do that. Um, if they're not on campus, then of course we have to think about, again, things like the digital divide and what's happening, who's being left out. Um, we know a lot more students, college students now are having to work even more than they did before because they're taking care and helping take care of their families. And so many students weren't even able to go back to school um, this, this fall semester. So there, there are a lot of the immediate needs um, that we um, try our best to um, respond to as they come in and, and point students to resources more um, locally or in their state that they might be able to um, access and tap into. On a larger scale, one of the things our organization is just thinking about is, again, looking a little bit forward and what does this look like is where the concern of we've already seen the disinvestment in higher ed and where that's going to go. Again, if we start talking about um, cuts in budget, state budgets, higher ed gets cut quickly um, and a lot. And this is really this really impacts um, students of color and Black students because so many of those schools, the public college universities lose money, um, which means less of financial aid, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's something we're keeping our eye on and keeping a close eye on um, in terms of what happens um, when, if, if that were to happen. And that's particular of concern for us because we just had a report come out some months ago about we took a look at public college universities where we're rolling back and how we're getting more and more of a segregated system more than ever um, is that, that we're, we're definitely going back in history in that time and we've got to stop that and we've got to move forward. Um, so that uh, I can send the resource so we can, we can share it with everybody, but that's something we have our eye on. Um, and then one of, one of the quick things, just in terms of this is more Fred's um, um, area, but I will say the data, you know, that we definitely need the data in terms of what's happening to students um, for when they go into college, where they're going afterwards, um, what's happening to them, um, how we're using data, making sure we have completed college transcripts. We just, we're just finding out that there are my higher ed team, that there are a lot of gaps in the data that we're getting from institutions of higher ed, and it's because there's not a cohesive system when it comes to uh, many of our, our higher ed system when it comes to colleges and universities. Yeah, I wanna thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, Asko, go ahead. No, I was, um, I was gonna thank you, Lynn, for that um, response. Um, and before we transition to the closing, um, I did see one last question from Janet. Um, I would like just to respect everyone's time. Um, we will get back to your question, Janet, um, offline, we'll answer your question. Um, and so without any further, ado, I'll have, hand it over to Aaron um, to close us out. Thank you, Scala. And I just want to thank all of the panelists for your time today. Uh, clearly, we did not uh, get to all the questions. We scratched the surface, uh, but in scratching the surface, you did an excellent job of highlighting the needs that the community faces from uh, a government level where resources are needed to the community level. Uh, and I just want to appreciate and thank you, one, for the work that you do daily, but two, for taking time out today to share that with us. Uh, I also just want to thank the audience members for taking time today to join us. Uh, again, this thought came from the place, uh, and as you see on your screen, we have a call to action. Uh, as you've heard several of our panelists say, uh, what's needed in addition to resources and funding are people. We need bodies, we need advocates, we need people that understand what advocacy is, which uh, a definition that TEP has uh, uh, highlighted is organized actions that have um, the goal of systemic change. Uh, that we don't, we don't only just want to address the need that we see immediately in front of us, but we have strategic actions that lead to systemic change. Uh, I listened to someone wiser than me say a well-defined problem is halfway to the solution that's needed. So we know that multifaceted problems need multifaceted solutions. So we know identifying the challenges and sharing some of the things that we've known and heard about and experienced is one step towards that. Another is this page and this resource will make sure to make available for everyone that's here. Both TEP and uh, UNCF have partnered to make sure that we have not only this document, which lists ways to become an advocate of learning, engaging, hosting, and writing, 
Uh, but also we're gonna take the resources from the organizations represented here and make sure we make that available to you even after this call. Uh, I just wanna highlight a few more events that are coming up. This panel was the first of three panels in total that will be happening. Um, in addition to this panel, we have one called Black Education Matters, creating an equitable learning environment for black students. And that's happening uh, next month uh, before um, we enter winter. Um, and then the next uh, panel will be Become the Sar by Faith, looking at the connection between community building and partnerships between HBCUs and the faith community. Uh, the UNCF has a community, has a event coming up shortly as well, uh, which is gonna happen on November 4th uh, or soon thereafter, which is uh, community conversations listening to students. Uh, so our takeaways are that there are a number of resources that are available for us to use. You can see we have a hashtag faith and advocacy uh, and several other hashtags on social media where we really wanna make sure that the faith community and people that have been impacted and affected by COVID and by our education system know that there are places to go to get resources and people that can assist you in doing the work of seeing solution. With that, I wanna thank uh, Pastor Curry, Dr. Jennings, Mr. Jones and Ms. Davis for your time today. I wanna to thank the United Negro College Fund, the UNCF for the partnership with the Expectations Project. We thank you for your time today and we look forward to our future conversations. With that, we'll close and thank you again for your participation. Thank you. Thank you all.